Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Facebook world, Spotify world, YouTube world. Uh, everybody out there in the listening land, we are so happy that you're with us tonight. I'm just trying to, there we go, trying to make a little bit of adjustments here and uh, get the studio ready. I am running a hair behind. I do apologize. So um, we're going to get this party started and I'll explain what the delay was here in just one second, but it was quite an interesting one. So tonight we're going to go back to uh, a series that we we know and love and we know you guys love it. And that is what we call the Titans of Industry series, right? We bring on these Titans and these are people that are, you know, the been there is done. That's getting it done in film, getting it done in comics, getting it done in toys. And uh, the gentleman that we're going to introduce tonight has been doing it in, in a couple of these different ones. And we'll kind of get into that. You're going to know his work. You might, you're going to recognize it when we say it. You might not exactly say, you're, you're just going to dawn on you where you've seen it before. Because I know you've all seen his work. And uh, we're going to talk about that. And then talk about kind of the journey to, uh, that, he, that you know, he went through to, uh, to do a few of these things. And as far as cons go, I'm going to read off a con list that is just unbelievable. Okay. As the, as the impact that this gentleman has in the con circuit. So uh, we're going to be going through that. And tonight's uh, man of the hour. Uh, is none other than Mr. Scott Zillner, and you will know him and love him. And to me, he has the most absolute interesting mustache in the world. And uh, that's quite an honor because we have a lot of mustaches and beards on this show. So that is a that is a place of honor. And we'll go through some of the different things in just one second. But um, as we always like to say, if everybody's all situated and locked in place and ready to go, got your seat belts on, roller coasters fix and take off, let's have some fun. If you guys are just tuning in, we're just getting started. We're a couple minutes behind schedule. I do apologize for that. Uh, tonight's guest is Mr. Scott Zillner, and he's in the green room waiting. And I'm going to bring in my partner in crime on this episode, and we're going to get started. So let's go ahead and bring in Dan. Good evening, good sir. Hello, hello, hello. It's Friday, my brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it's a hat. Well, I was going to say it's a happy Friday, but it has not been so far. <laughs> so, But it's about uh, to get better. It's about to get a lot better. You know um, why it's going to get better? Because we're talking about two of my favorite things. Toys. And more toys. There you go. But see, that's, you know, that's what, what more can we say right there? So good night, everybody. We glad you came out. No, just, we, uh, to, toys are, toys are it, man. And, and as you can see in the studio, this whole place is 360 degrees worth of toys. Toys, comics, movies, you name it. Um, yeah. It's its its my 80s childhood just splattered all over the wall. It's the perfect 10-year-old's room, okay? That's thats why I kind of set this up. You don't but say. You don't say. You see, Dan, <laughs> Dan's got the same thing. It's just, it's a its a, a habit and a sickness that has taken over most of our adult life. Um, quick, quick story. Box and I'm addicted to toys. <laughs> it's me, you all. There you go. We'll just we'll just everybody sign in real quick, and, and everybody will all take roll. Um, I'm a toyaholic. Oh man, as myself, and I and I've got a couple of the ones we're going to show tonight. A couple of them on the way, so we'll, we'll kind of go into that. So the short version of what happened is I was late, kind of running, getting everything set up. Um, we noticed that uh, one of our dogs, uh, Red Bones, uh, had something on his shoulder, and he had gotten in a fight back when he was in the kennel when we were on vacation. And we had been treating it. We thought everything was fine. But my wife felt that she was this kind of just shoulder feels hot. So she felt around on it. She was right. It was hot. So we hurried up and brought him over to ask the vet if we could work him in. And we're so glad we did because it was an abscess. Mm. And and they cut an abscess out pretty good size, you know, probably uh, about the size of a softball. Well, not quite. Maybe, maybe more like a baseball out from underneath his arm. It had worked its way around. And so he's 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 so out of it right now. Um, so. We just got him back, just got him situated, um, and uh, he's still drunk from the anesthesia, so we had to kind of get him situated in the house. So, yeah, I'm back. Um, it's been a rough morning, 
And in trying to get out the door, um, our poor little, you know, my, my poor, uh, our studio dog that, that hangs out at my feet all the time, as blind as a bat, is Rudy. Uh, he didn't know what was going on, and he was zigging and zagging. And as I'm trying to get out the door, he knocked my shoe off. And when he did, I promptly smashed um, my foot, which I had just gotten worked on, into the baseboard. So um, if I could have took a seat next to, to Whiskey in the vet's office and had got worked on myself, I would have done it. Um, so, yeah, it's not been the best of mornings, but like you said, it's an awesome afternoon now. And without further ado, uh, I'm going to kind of run through a little bit of his accolades and then we'll bring him on. Um, there's a show that just aired just now. Uh, the Magnificent World of Toys presents uh, toy expert and collector Scott Zillner. And again, uh, lives, breathes, and just everything toys. And when I first uh, noticed Scott, it was on the Netflix series, The Toys That Made Us. And he was on episode three. And uh, uh, once I watched that episode, I reached out and we got to talking toys and video games and all kind of good fun like that. And we're going to go ahead and kind of go through that and uh, let him kind of kind of lead the way on that discussion. So without further ado, here is Mr. Scott Zoner. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks, hello. Scott. Welcome. Welcome, good sir. Nice so, to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you for having me on. This is really great. It's uh, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of good fun. And uh, I, like I said I was a, a big fan once I saw everything, and then, <laughs> and then got got to notice. I was like, wow, he did that, and he did that, and he did that thing, and he did that thing, and just kind of started adding up. I was like, oh man, we got to get him on the show. <laughs> we got to talk about all the cool, fun stuff he's been doing. I I dig the GI Joe shirt too because I know you have the uh, the tattoo that goes with it. So there you go. There you go. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm 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 an official fan. You know. Nice. You are. Yeah, an I, have my, ninja. I see. I have my my proof of purchase is on my arm. I'm good to go. <laughs> there you go. My, is that, uh, you were probably all, all the flag points are are there. You know. Nice. Oh, yeah. Nice. So you were probably digging the the Hasbro Pulse. What yesterday? I think when they rolled out the GI Joes this year. Yeah, you know, I, I I was I was prepared, yet I was I still think they just they they really have been in fact i'm wearing the gi joe shirt because i i shot a video today that i'll load up for next week on all the different stuff that they've been really listening to the fans mm -hmm. you know when the, when the when the figures first came out people are like yeah i finally got a figure but i i don't like it a lot <laughs> the, the, the fan base is like we want vintage looking mm -hmm. with modern detail and they're yeah. like oh, okay what about this and we're like you're close. You're not quite there, but you're close. you're close. Make them really vintage, exactly like we had them, but bigger and better. And then they're yep. like, okay, what about this? And they finally hit that stride where they're nailing nice. the figures out. And you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the vintage figure in a modern form. I'm going to buy that. Here's my I've got movie. my Storm Shadow on order in the, in the vintage costume. Yeah. S speaking of fans, here's one of your fans right now. It says Scott cuts uh, Scott Zoner fan here. Hey. Uh. <laughs> um, you know it, uh, it. It it's it's a it's a great thing to see your favorite toy line become a modern toy line and and and, yeah. and how popular it is. But then at the same time. It's internet culture too, so yeah. you have to fight everyone that believes they know how to make a toy line better than Hasbro, and yeah. or or the hatred that people have towards Super Seven. Oh God, and, yes, yeah. that's all, I've watched that unfold like crazy. That in the in the fight between okay, you either like Revelations or you don't for Motu. So there's a whole, and I still yeah, have a hard time and, saying Motu. I'm always Masters of the Universe, so I'm still stuck <laughs> on having to say Motu culturally now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, that's because you're a part of the Masters culture, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and what, what that really comes down from is I want something the same that I had as a kid, but I want it modern. Oh, but you changed something from when I was 12. How dare you? And it's like, yeah. We're not making toys for 12 year old you. Right. We're making toys for 40 year old you mm -hmm. and 12 year old sons and daughters. You know, like it's mm -hmm. not just for you, it's for that new generation as well. Right. And well, the biggest the biggest thing I saw was somebody making a comment that 
but Super 7's not making what I want. And I was like, well, then don't buy it. Yeah. Go and buy something else. But Super 7's making stuff I want. Yep. And I'm not telling you to buy it. I'm telling you to buy whatever you want. I'm happy with the, the character choices that they're giving us on this line. They're giving us toys that Hasbro would never make in a million years. Exactly. Uh, a Games Master drone. Yeah. Um, you know, space shock troopers like that. That's stuff that Hasbro wouldn't touch. Yeah. And this is how you can get them. Super Seven's going to do those deep dives and give us figures that we'll never get from Hasbro. And if anything, it's actually making Hasbro pay attention. And they're like, oh, sh <laughs> should we make animated figures? You know, like mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're making they're going back and they're doing that now because of the pressure that Hasbro's like you know, that super sevens being able to push out stuff that they never thought they could make or would be a popular toy whatsoever. You know, you know, and then Scott flashing back to what you just said about 12 year old me and wanting these toys, you know, I mean, here's, here's 13 year old me Optimus prime. Uh -huh. Super happy that I still have this, you know, here's adult me Optimus prime that can do everything that he can do that the 13 year old mind can do, but looks more like the prime I, I wanted. And yeah. You know, I, I had somebody ask me one time why I buy so many superhero figures. I mean, well, quite frankly, you know, when I was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, the figures I had couldn't do stuff like this. They, they, they no. oops, I'm way out of the way here. You yeah, know, yeah. You couldn't fold the arms back. You couldn't pose yeah. them like these. I mean, and yeah. so well, I mean, that, that, these people that get mad, it just, it makes no sense. It's like, take what you're getting and enjoy it because it's. Be happy they're making toys. Yeah. Period. Yes. Because yeah. with the way things are, we're, we're we're really lucky to have these toys at all. And right. your Optimus Primes are a real uh, uh, a real point of look at how much these toys have grown. Oh, the old I mean, toys don't always work. Now that's not a G one Prime. No. Yeah. No, I I got this. When did I? I can't even remember when I got this. But my. Uh, but compare it to a G one Prime. Yes. The G1 yeah. Prime gives you nostalgia, mm -hmm. but it's not as nice. It's not as good as no. the modern Prime. No. Right. Look at the G1 Megatron. It's a horrible figure. Oh, yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but why do we love it? We love it because we're in love with the dream that we yep. had of it as a kid. Yep. But every modern Megatron is much better than the gun Megatron we had as a kid. It, it's, it, it sucks. It's, it's so it's so awesome now because uh, my youngest is getting into Transformers now. He kind of he was when he was younger, and he's getting back into it now when he's in his twenties. And we we talk Transformers now. You know, I just found him a Transformer last night, a G one Transformer on one of the vintage toy uh, shows that pop up. You know, and that's kind of been all over the nation now. There's a whole handful of these vintage toy shows that are capitalizing on you know Masters of the Universe being popular, GI Joe being popular. You know, that whole realm in the 80s, they're buying it up like crazy and reselling it. And they get a chance to touch upon the newer figures. So like, well, you can go back to your childhood and get this. Or if you want the one with more bells and whistles, hey, we have that too. Yeah, so yeah. there's there's you know, a lot I, of that going on. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it, it gives you a lot more buying opportunity. You don't have to buy at all. Buy what you want. Buy what, what, what makes you happy. And if you're not buying what makes you happy, go buy something else. Yeah, exactly. You, really, you need to speak with your wallet. You should only buy and collect stuff that make you happy. And, and, and I've had to purge a few times. You know, my wife and I move around the country. So we've purged twice in the move from, we went from uh, Georgia to Colorado to now in Washington State. And I, the studio that I have now is about half the size of the studio I had in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. So I've got a whole toy store in the garage right now. That I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, what do I really, really want to hold on to? Um, and I just keep changing out. Like, you can't see it's out of frame, but the whole side over here is just a giant display of Star Wars, G.I. Joe. Um, it's got He-Man. It's got, you know, some some Knight Rider stuff sprinkled in there, some Ghostbusters stuff. Anything from the 80s is all intermixed. Robots. I mean, there's a whole, you can't see it behind me, but there's a whole, you know, Voltron and all kind of stuff behind me. Um, um, and I've got a whole, I don't even have them out yet, but I have a whole series of 70s those metal robots, right. That we all kind of, the, the all that stuff. Yes. All, all yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. 
Um, he has not yet invited me to come shopping in his garage, though, and for this, <laughs> I'm definitely disappointed. It, it, but again, I just have to kind of, again, like you said, narrow that search to, okay, what exactly is going to make me the happiest on display? Yeah. And, um, and, and go for it. Um, I've sold off complete, complete uh, collections before. I had a, a pretty expensive and extensive uh, Superman collection. I was like, hmm, I've been looking at it for about three years. I kind of want to fill something else in that slot. So sold the whole collection off and moved something else in its place. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, and that that's part of the collector world. Is, you know, you're buying something today and you're in love with it now, but in a month or a year, you may not be you know fully involved with that. You want to get something else and you can swap and move stuff around. And like you said, I've I've let go of my superpowers collection like three times. Mm -hmm. And then we're like, oh, I want it again. Yeah. <laughs> so now, now I won't let it go. Like I have my yeah. superpowers collection. It's staying right over here. I'm never going to sell it. If I get rid of it, it goes into a box, mark superpowers, warning, yep. tiger, don't open. And I'll dig it back up at some point. I, I do that with comic collections. Ones, Scott, as we travel through my room here. Uh, let's see. He'll appreciate that. Now, if you can see my superpowers down there <laughs> with the collector's case. Oh, I, I see uh, a bat copter. That's I don't have a bat copter. I stumbled. I stumbled into this. Um, I was at work at my day gig one day, and I got a phone call on my cell. This woman out of the blue said she had been given my name and that I might be able to help her and her husband there. Their oldest son had had been killed in a car crash a few years ago, and they finally decided that it was time to liquidate his stuff. And so he had all these toys, you know, from the 70s and 80s. We're about the same age. And so um, they asked if I could come out and kind of help them identify what they had and price out everything for them. So she sent me pictures, and I saw the, the superpowers figures and immediately started salivating. So I went out and I talked to them, you know, I told them what they had and I told them what things were worth. And I mean, I, I put together a pretty comprehensive list for them and everything. And she said, uh, is there anything you'd like? I'm like, well, there's there's certainly a few items here that I would uh, that I would love to have. And so I snagged all the superpower stuff and um, except for, believe it or not, the Batcopter and the Lexor 7. But I, snagged, I got the rest of them. I grabbed the, the case and everything. And I said, well, you know what these are worth? You know, how much How much would you like for it all? And she said, $45. Yeah. I, I went, oh, okay. Because, you know, there's a male in Clark Kent there. There's a dark side, all that, you know. And um, she said, you know, I do have a few more things that we need to that we need to price out. So would you be interested in help with that? And I said, so sure. So, you know, she, she brings out, like, the next weekend I go over and she's got these bags and bags full of Beanie Babies. So I start working on those and I put together a list of everything she had, you know, priced it all out. And she said, um, just go ahead and pick out a couple of things that you want for doing all that. So the Batcopter and the Lexor 7 came home for free. There you I go. think it's a fair trade. <laughs> well, when you're talking about rebuilding collections and not letting certain stuff go, I kind of had to rebuild a little bit about it. Speaking of, there's the, the mail-in Clark Kent. I had to, yep. I had to start rebuilding a little bit of the collection myself. So yeah, we all, and there, this stuff's just scattered all over this place. Um, and this is a, a post that I put out there and I don't know how you feel about knockoffs, but, um, knockoffs are kind of, can be kind of fun. This is a, a knockoff He-Man that to me looks more like, uh, Rocky Balboa with, <laughs> you know, with, with the character. Right. You know so. what I, I've been thinking <laughs> a while now is that, the bootleg KO toys are actually worth more money than the real toys now. Yeah, you're often right. Often they were not protected, they were not taken care of, they were open, played with, and destroyed. Yes, they were never made in the numbers that the other toys were, and therefore they're actually technically rare. And then when you get collectors that have bought everything there is to buy, what's left to buy? The yes. knockoff knockoffs, yeah. yeah. releases. The stuff that's hard to get, and that makes all of those toys worth more than the originals. Yep, you're right, mm -hmm. and and I and I love a good knockoff. I mean, I love and I love people that do stuff that kind of change a little bit to kind of make it their own. Mm -hmm. See, there's another like one. Robert Cop. Yeah, yes. Yes. everybody has seen the yeah. Robert Cop meme. I yeah. love Robert Cop. This is a knockoff that somebody went ahead and made into a 
you know, and yeah. and that kind of stuff is just a, a lot of fun. It's a one off, right? So yep. I mean, it's a it's a it's just something that you can hold on to. And I uh, I, I love the the way that everybody can kind of talk about it, can kind of say, this is what was my favorite toy. And like you said, this is what I would like to see in a toy now. Um, and, and just have those discussions and just, um, and, and, and really get the feedback that gets to the toy makers. They go, you know what? Like you said in the beginning, I think we could do that. And yeah. uh, they keep giving a shot. Um, I think the, uh, I think there's been times where they've tried certain things. Like when they tried to reboot star Wars, a couple of, you know, versions ago, everybody went, eh, that's kind of like '90s comics. It just kind of, whew, just kind of flatlined, and we are like, "Oh, that was so could have been," you know. And then just kind of paused, and then it picked back up again. But it, you know, they can't they can't win them all. I mean, they they're trying. At least right. they're trying, like you said. At yeah. least they're still making toys. Um, at least we're getting toys. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, one thing too that that I'm seeing. Obviously, you can see behind me. I'm a huge Marvel Legends fan. You're and a so, moderate Marvel Legends fan, but that that paltry amount of toys it's oh. nice that you try oh that that hurts, it's, it's, <laughs> that hurts. It's, if you would care to part with any of yours i've seen pictures oh of yourself. oh yes <laughs> um the, it is basically it doesn't take on a room in his house it is taking over the house <laughs> yeah i uh i there's not a room in the house that is, does not have toys mm. which is which is awesome <laughs> so that's just we'll get to now one of the one of the rooms uh, I got a snapshot here real quick of of a room that um, would be most fun in anybody's home is this one right here. Is, That's yeah. my old house. Yeah. It's not my new house, but yeah, that was my living room in my old house. Yeah, um, that was my valley when I lived in the valley. the The Tron game is probably the unicorn that I would like to to you know get a hold of one day. Um, I've got I think you know at that time I had four of them. Oh wow! Yeah. Hmm. That's that's awesome, and and the other thing too is, and I did not come across a picture of. I have seen pictures of it before. Is um, for those out there in the listening audience, uh, Scott got a chance to work on. If you remember the toys that are being played with, if the discussion between, of course, uh, the flashback right of of you know the childhood coming up, and um, right before you know he leaves to be sucked into the the machine forever. He's he's playing with the cycle and he's playing with you know a couple of different figures. That's the figures that that Scott was able to, to reproduce and yeah, did so quite on, well. On on Tron Legacy, the toys in the kids' room, I was in charge of that project and I painted uh, the figures in his hands and the uh, light bikes on the shelf. Yeah, the light bikes are awesome. I've always loved light bikes. And then the it was Clue, wasn't it? Clue is what he was holding up. Yeah, yeah we um, did a flint, we did a, a a Tron and a Clue, but I think only Clue made it into the uh, shot. Yeah. So, well, of course, and Tron is sitting there right next to, to you, if I'm correct there, Kevin. Oh, yeah. I've got, you know, one of the, the ones that was re-released, the the Walgreens version. Yeah, the there. Diamond Select uh, wave of those is really nice. Yeah, yeah. They, they did a good job. Um, there's a, I want some of the bigger ones as well. They make some of the bigger figures that I need to get in here. But um, And then I did actually get in. We were talking, uh, Scott and I talked games the other day. I got in the, the Deadly Disc uh atari 2600 version of tron you know and i was like oh man this is so cheap but yet so fun to play <laughs> yeah i have a a full stand-up disc of tron okay. and uh i got like one of my one of my early on professional days i got a really big check and what what do you do when you get one of those really big checks is like well i could pay my rent for six months or I can buy a Tron arcade machine, and I bought a Tron arcade machine. Uh, <laughs> Good. I, I think all of us would have would have done that. Yeah, yeah. so I uh, I did that with one of those early checks. I got it. I've had a disc Tron machine for you know a couple of decades now. It's great. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's always that's always a good. One. And um, speaking of going to do that, here is uh, here's and I'll kind of bring shots throughout the throughout the show. Here's a shot of you know, <laughs> getting getting to uh, to talk with uh, you know. Tron himself. And, yeah, uh, it, the, you know those are probably two of my my highlights of my career. Um, I got to build and and do a, a, a Tron toy called Tron Stitch. I designed that, um, and I got to paint several Luke Skywalker's over my career, and then I got to be on a show with Mark Hamill, uh, uh, Mark Hamill's Pop Culture Quest. I was a yeah. guest. 
and was then that I the had, one where you guys were yep that's, playing with Godzilla. That's this one right here, yeah. Here Robert, yeah, I got, uh, this, I got to be on a show. And here's a nice little trivia: if you look on my seat, you see a reflection just a tiny bit on the back of the seat. Uh huh. That's a cane because I had to bring a cane to walk because I like cut the back of my leg really bad my oh, wow. the night before. Um, the cane is actually a cane from uh, uh, imp, uh, Return of the Jedi. It's an Emperor's cane, uh -huh. and I actually took an Emperor's cane to meet Mark Hamill, and I had to use uh -huh. it in there. there you go. Well, I didn't notice it the first time I saw the picture, but it looks like I noticed here you have a sock on your right foot. So in the picture. Oh uh, no! I'm just wearing two different shoes. Oh, two different shoes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I do that. tell from the shot. Um, but that's a that's a whole cool. You know, I think this discussion was on um, monsters versus robots. I believe. Uh, you know, we were originally supposed to do robots, and then Mark wanted to talk about Godzillas, and I'm like, I can easily swing back over mm -hmm. and talk about Godzillas, and so we talked about Godzillas. Y you're like when Luke wants to talk uh, Godzilla, we'll talk Godzilla. Especially yeah, I, was, I wasn't going to correct him. Yeah. He's like, these are not the robots you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> we had a my house with an that. emperor's cane. We're talking Godzilla. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it was uh, it was really great. I got to work on Tron the movie. I got to have Bruce Boxleitner as a guest at one of my conventions. And I got to design the Tron Stitch, which is still a very in-demand designer toy today to this day. So, And I, and I think I read... Um, a post of the day you were talking about you were over at Disney World and you got a chance to see that some of the Indiana Jones you had originally done were still uh out in the store in production. Still yeah, yeah, like almost almost uh almost 20 years now they've been in the or like it's like 15 years. Oh wow. Nice. So I've, I've had an Indiana Jones figure in the, in Disneyland and Disney World for almost 50, over 15 years at this point. So and, and I, I mean, remember seeing I may have one that was designed because I've got my my Disney Indiana Jones. He's actually he's actually down on stairs in a tote with my vintage Star Wars because I have yeah, to carry the Marvel the Legends theater. scale one. Yeah. What's that? The the Marvel Legends six inch scale. Oh yep. Okay. Yep, yep. Nice. I'll have to dig him out the next time. So I say when, once you get to talking about it, you start looking around like he did that and he did that and he did that. And just the list goes on and on. So, Scott, I, I think, for the viewers that, that don't know much about you, how long have you been in the industry? You know, what, what got you started? Um, you know, I, I, I've been doing professional work since the early 2000s. Okay. And then I want to say, like, I moved to L.A. in 2006. And that was really the start of me doing this as a full-time profession, working in the toy industry, working in the convention industry, uh, working in TV and film um, since 2006. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to throw up a, just a list real quick. When we talk about conventions, it's not a couple, okay? Let's just kind of do just, a couple shows. A couple, a couple. He feels a, a couple, couple shows. shows. Leave him alone. He did a couple in, shows. It's you know in between his other stuff, he's got you know this kind of list, right? Okay. I mean, you know, he's already doing the toy thing, right? He's the owner at Planet X Toys and then co-owner of, of the Valley and, and Comic Fest. And it just goes on and on. You know, owner of, um, you know, Megabit Game Expo, owner and founder of Toy Wizards, you know, Toon Con, uh, Japan World of Heroes, which I've seen a lot of pictures from that one. Uh, the Sack Toy Con, the, you know, Brick Boutique, um, just again and again. And the, the one I think I've seen the most pictures of is from, is from this one right here. So... I think yeah, I've seen a lot from Morphicon is the big show. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, is that is that the one that that's the one that's over in Japan, isn't it? Is that the one that you go over for that one or no? No, no. Uh, Power Morphicon is in Pasadena or L in the L.A. area. Gotcha. Okay. Every other year, but with COVID, we've been out of it for four years. Yeah. So it's coming back this year in August twenty sixth through twenty eighth in Pasadena and it's going to be just a fabulous great show because everyone's been gone for so long yeah that normally it's every other year now it's going to be a real reunion not just for the cast but the fans and the just the fans to be back with each other in a convention atmosphere like it, you know it's been a long time so everyone's really looking forward to coming out and having a good time oh yeah and and the toy side of it I've, like I said I've been a fan of both for many, many years. And, um, you know, I've gotten to the point to when I go to cons now, I'm doing it for both. Right. So I don't have it hung up. I've got it in a tote. I've got to break out, but, um, 
I started asking some of the some of the stars, like, okay, what was your favorite movie role? Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I got a chance to to go to this see what was this probably three or four years ago, probably four years ago to the Walker Stalker in Atlanta. And I asked, I said, okay, what is the, you know, uh, one of the stars said, what is your um, favorite role? And it was Yondu was his, was his favorite role. And they Mm. had just got through shooting uh, guardians of the galaxy two at that point. So, you know, a lot of his stuff is basically, you know, walking dead. So when that happened, the next year I brought back the Yondu Marvel figure, which he thought was pretty cool. And he signed some other stuff from some other movies. And of course signed that. And I've got that I've got to put up. And then um, a lot of Walking Dead stuff was signed. But man, uh, on the saddest note, when we moved from uh, Georgia to Colorado, a lot of our collection, a lot of our mint in, you know, on card and stuff got destroyed or damaged because the Packers just didn't care. They didn't know what collections were. They didn't care. They just um, put it in a the box. They put it, you know, folded mint on card stuff, you know, folded the card and shoved it in a box. To make it fit, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, That's it was, painful. So we basically, my wife and I, she collects as well. We basically had a, an opening party, and just you know, like Christmas, just tore up and everything that was damaged, and, and you know, let it free like Toy Story, right? Just let it run all over and get out of the box and take a breath. But some things we kept, but it took about a year for some of the packages to the plastic to pop back out, and it did, which was you know, signed things. So. Yeah, that was a that was a opening a box moment and kind of had a I took a couple years off my life with some of that stuff. Yeah, you know, uh, from my move from the valley to this place, I still haven't unpacked a bunch of stuff, and I'm like, oh yeah, where is my lightsaber? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I have a real lightsaber, and I'm like, nice. I don't know where that is? Where's my my batter ring and my bat grappling gun? And I just don't know where they are. They're still packed away somewhere, and I haven't unpacked them. So and and that's help. We'll be happy to come join. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll come over. We'll help. We'll help uh, undo some boxes. Yeah, but it's it, it's. We'll I, do a I live was, opening party. I <laughs> was so I was so like I said, just um, taken back by some of the way it was treated. I just couldn't. Uh, I, it took me about a, about a year to want to start collecting again. It was just kind of a you know, shot to the stomach and it just, I really kind of had to kind of, um, you know, uh, go through that. Now, now again, the, the Michael Rorker stuff that I was talking about a second ago, um, was intact and, and I learned and I took the main, main things that I had that I really cared for and was really signed and everything. And that stayed in our vehicle that I drove myself. Um, and I packed probably about 90% of the collection from Colorado to here to Washington state. So that, pretty much survived um i did have an ad at and some other things where the jaw guns were just bent in for some reason um things that didn't make sense the 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 um my plane from from gi joe the wings were just bent down um just stuff that didn't make sense that was all jam that could be some temperature issues with those yeah it could be um yeah. but but you know the I think it was a mix. I think you're right. I think the temperature was, I don't, it's not a temperature control control building. And they just, it's kind of like the, the end of Indiana Jones, right? They just kind of shove it in a warehouse with all these boxes yeah. and it just stays there. And I asked the woman about it. I said, you know, there's, is this place temperature controlled or can I pay extra for that or what? She said, Oh yeah, you can pay extra for that. She said, it's um your, your square foot you have. It's by the pound. I said, oh, okay. I said, uh, how many pounds is it? And she said, Oh, you rang up to 17,500 pounds worth of cargo. And uh, it's a dollar a pound per month. I was like, mm, it doesn't have to be cooled. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they get you on that kind of stuff. And, the, you know, the poundage is because they packed it. So yeah. they made sure to pack it in as multiple boxes, as much yeah. tape. Mm-hmm. Obviously not enough bubble wrap, but, uh, yeah. Well, we kind of jokingly said we thought we got, they pay, got paid by the paper because – um, we packed 90% of the house before they showed up, learning from last time that we did not want, you know, thousands of dollars worth of stuff destroyed. Um, so we did it ourselves. And they got there and they were upset. And they said, oh, we have to open everything. I said, but why? Oh, you could be trafficking drugs or, you know, we're responsible for the boxes. And I no, was like, oh. that was that was the scam. All these movers exactly. are scams. They are scams. Yeah. And, and, and I said, I don't not necessarily believe that, but I'll open the box with you. You can poke around in it, but you're not unpacking anything. We, yeah. can, we can shuffle through it together. 
And we did, and all these boxes, they wanted to put more paper, and then they folded the box down, which turned the top into a basketball. Uh, I said, okay, people, you're the professionals here. You put paper. They're charging you, put you for all that paper. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, so when you said, when you stack two basketballs on top of each other, they don't fit together too well. Nope. So no, quick put, I said, then when you press the paper down, guess what? It presses on everything inside, which is plastic and cardboard and, you know, brittle yeah. and whatnot. So yeah, don't do, don't do that anymore. So yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's been a, for those of you out there in the collecting world, moving is a horrific experience at times. And then like Scott said, then you lose everything. You're like, where's yeah, this? Where's that? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've made several moves since uh, coming down to LA and every move there's boxes and boxes of stuff that just never get unpacked, you yeah. know? Oh well, I won't unpack that. I'll, I'll just make a new mess with all new toys, and that stuff is I, tired. I literally have boxes in the garage right now. No lie, they have not been they have not been unpacked in two years, and and that's where part of the collection is. And and I've got stuff. I've got to make room. I've got a car shipping in, and there's no excuses anymore. I can't I can't not talk my way out of it. I have to unpack these boxes, and we're finding all kind of stuff down there. We kind of make an evening of it some days, and just and go see what's there, but. Um, I like the toy that you thought you had, but you thought you lost and you buy another one and then you find it in the box. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and it happens a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. We, but been let's, let's, house for six years and we went through uh, and discovered a cache of, of hidden boxes and started going through them. And we're like, Oh wow. We, we, we still have this stuff. Yeah. Right. Here, here, time is, it. here is uh speaking and we're talking about movies and, and, and some of the different things and in movie wise, uh, you may have noticed Scott <laughs> in this movie. That so, was my that was my first theatrical appearance. So I I was like I know that guy I've seen that movie. So, oh, I had so much hair. <laughs> yep. I'm envious. Well, I did. I should have put one up here, but I did when I was pulling pictures for the show. I did see a picture of Scott without a beard or mustache. So that I does happen. Yeah, it, it's I was old. like, who's that guy? <laughs> You know, is that Scott's brother? You know, I was like, so, and then another, um, this is talking about the stuff that he's done and some of the painting stuff. Here's a good example of some I didn't of the do collection. everything in this photo. Uh, no. I did the Spider-Man, the Deadpool and the Thanos. Yeah. And that's, that's the one I, I pulled. I pulled a picture as a close up of the Thanos. There's the I, Thanos. Yeah. Yep. That is sweet. That one's, that one's about to be in route to this collection momentarily. So well, you're lucky because that is sold out. Um, it's no longer available. I, I found a hidden stash of some, and uh, I am going to after this episode. I found it um, late last night when I was hunting around for one, and found one, and it's it's about to be in transit. So that's great because uh, they are sold out from Sideshow at this point. And then the other one that I really really liked, uh, and I actually saw this one first, was this guy. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, I, I knew Stanley from conventions a long time. I've met him, you know, maybe 20 times over the years. And I was glad to be able to do a portrait version of him. And something that I added to the paint was he always had really red cheeks. And I made sure to give him a little blush on to the paint, onto the cheeks and the nose where he was naturally a little flushed in those areas. Yep. And yep. Uh, they kept it through the production, so it came out looking really nice. And I was, nice. I was happy with a little bit of addition just because I knew Stan. So the, mm -hmm. the, the call-out was just skin tone, but I added that blush to just give it a little more natural presence of Stan, and it, and it really worked. I got a chance to uh, to meet him in person in 2010 when he came to uh, when he came to New Orleans, and um, I brought my boys with me and and I said, "Look, Dad wants to meet Stan Lee first off, and then after that, the rest of the three days of the show is yours. You can we can do whatever <laughs> and whatever." And so we didn't sit in line too too long. We were probably I don't know 15 or 20 back, and um, he had a whole entourage, of course, around him, and um, it was uh, I of course you know had my fan fan geek moment and halfway blacked out during the whole thing. And I remember <laughs> shaking his hand, telling him I enjoyed his work. He said, thank you. He signed my amazing Spider-Man, which I still have. Um, and uh, my boys didn't, didn't want anything signed. Didn't bring anything. I'd be like, yeah, but it's Stan Lee, you know, it's just, yeah. like, Nope, they didn't, they didn't quite register. Right. It's not in their, in their bracket of, of, you know, time, but they wanted to meet, you know, uh, some of the ones they, my youngest at the time, 
uh, wanted to meet Norman Reedus. Mm -hmm. And um, that's back when it was in the height of everything going on with The Walking Dead, which I gained a lot of respect for Reedus because he took the time with my son. You know, there was a line of thousands of people. and I've got shots of just all these people behind us. And uh, I told my son, I said, look, I said, you can, you know, we've been here for a few days. You can either take a photo with him or you get something signed. You know, dad, dad's kind of running out of cash. Um, so he said, well, he said, uh, I'd like to get a picture with him. I said, okay. So we got the picture and then, you know, Mason's carrying the photo out like it's on a pillow, right? He's got it kind of, <laughs> and, and I was like, well, you know, wow. I said, it's kind of one of those moments to where, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I really want to do something else. So I went ahead and I said, do you want that signed? He's like, oh yeah, can we? So we get into yet another line, right? And, uh, I'm at, I asked the handler. It's like, so again, this is back again, you know, uh, 12 years ago, I said, what is he pulling down for cash for a show like this? And of course the handle like looks around, like he's about to tell a bad joke. And he goes quarter of a mil. I said, cash. He said, Oh yeah. Quarter mil cash. He said, uh, people come by the hotel and they do like two, $3,000 an hour worth of signings. You block an hour off, which I knew they had done that. I just didn't know what it cost. Uh -huh. And of course people are, you know, sh uh, store owners are bringing everything they yeah. have. That's Norman Reedus. And, getting a flat fee of like two or 3000 and getting him to sign, you know, so, you know, making a few thousand a night, sitting there eating a sandwich, you know, watching TV. Um, and, uh, so, but again, he took his time and asked my son, he said, what's your name, little man? He said, uh, you know, uh, my name's Norman. It's not that cool. What's your name? He said, Mason. Oh, that's a really cool name. You know, he's got his, his talk down. Right. And he's, yeah, yeah. he's signed, he's signed everything, you know, spraying silly string in the crowd and stuff. But, um, it's crazy because I've met him, I don't know, eight or 10 times now. And he's literally, been walking by and I've been in another line for something else. And he stepped that line and came up and talked to me like he knew me. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if I have that familiar face. Um, what is funny it's though, familiar beard. it's the familiar beard. Now it is the Opie beard from sons of anarchy. I can say that <laughs> because, uh, that is, and I've I said this on other shows, but that is the, that is the look that, uh, caught the attention of my wife. So, um, I didn't have the full opie. I had kind of just kind of like a half opie at the time. Yeah, and I've grown the rest out since then. Yeah, and um, we met him in in Atlanta, and he's a big dude, man. Or he's you know I'm six four, and he I'm looking at his chest, you know, and uh, he took pictures with us and signed some stuff. I told my wife, I said you got to tell him that you know you think we look alike. That's that's why you went out with me, you know. And I, so I was like, I guess if there's somebody I look like, I guess Opie's the one. That's not not, <laughs> not too bad, but um. But no, the uh, some of the stuff. What was if if you had to go back through your career and think of maybe if there was a toy line that you worked on that you probably figure is your favorite? What what would you think that would be? You know, I'm uh, I was really really happy to work on all of the different Tron stuff when Tron had come out. Yeah, um, that was probably you know one of the high points of my career is that I worked on Tron the movie, I worked on Tron the toy line, I worked on. Uh, Tron Stitch. I worked on uh, Tomy keychains only available in Japan for Tron. Wow. Like I got to do a lot of work on Tron. And until that point, I thought working on Star Wars was great. I was one of the, the Star Wars guys um, because of my product knowledge. You know, if like, they had a question, they would go to Scott and I'd be like, oh, well, yeah, see, that's that's the wrong belt buckle for that chest piece. <laughs> nice. That's from episode you know, Return of the Jedi, but that's at Empire Strikes Back, and we got to reverse those, and, you know, mm -hmm. I knew all that stuff all the time, and so uh, I really enjoyed working on Star Wars, and then I finally got to do my stint on Tron, and that included, like, Tron Legacy. I had a, a strip of the neon stuff that they were using to mm -hmm. try to come up with the correct neon colors to match wow. the ones, and... um. You know, there was a lot of a lot of work and detail into it, but uh, I gave it my all because it was the project that I was, you know, most most happy to work on. And and ever since I've got to do stuff for Star Wars, I got to do uh, an ATM six that's still at Disneyland and Disney World. I got to do a bunch of toys for when Solo had come out. I got to do displays for Disney World for Solo Star Wars Adventure. Um, I've got to work on quite a bit of different things for Lucas over the years. And uh, I just got to do a spaceship for some new project uh, that's still in my office. Like I, I, I still got to go finish it after this tonight. Oh, wow. That's uh, awesome. 
I hope the manager isn't listening. I thought that was done. I thought that was, yeah. That's We paid you for that two weeks ago. <laughs> I, I, I said I would hand it in. It will be done when I hand it in. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I love working on science fiction stuff. I love working on starships. I love working in those universes that I that I grew up with and then now I'm part of. Yeah. And it's really amazing. Like sometimes I look at my phone and I'm like, Oh yeah, you know, Storm Shadow's calling me again. Like, you know, that happens on a on, on, on yep. a basis where these people um recently for Pasadena Comic Con, we had Ernie Reyes Jr. as a guest. And I've known him over the years. So like Ernie calls me, he's like, Hey, can I get, get on this show? I'm like, Yeah. He's like, Can you make me a banner? I'm like, I've got you. You know, yeah. no problem. It's taken care of. And his daughter is now becoming this new martial artist actress. And I'm just like, I just want to remember the day that you came and did my show because eventually you're going to be too big to come to my events. Uh, you know, like, you know, you're going to be so big when, when she hits her stride as an actress. Yeah. You're like, yeah, I was her first convention. She went to my Pasadena show. Exactly. Like, it, was, yeah. it was really nice to grow up with these people and then become part of that world in a sense, as you're an adult, it's, uh, it's really fantastic. Well, that was, that was cool talking to, uh, when I was talking to Edgar, we Edgar and I talk often past him. And, uh, when he was talking about catching up to the, uh, the Pasadena show and, and doing that stuff and everything. And, uh, that was cool. It's like, Oh man, we got to get some shots of you guys together. And he was sending me some stuff. And I was like, that's, <laughs> that's, that's cool. These different people, you know, in the toy business that all kind of get together for shows. But, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I, I agree with you 110%. Being able to, to talk to the people that had influences on your childhood, I mean, the the you know the, the Flash Gordon poster stands out to everybody when they see that. And, I have um, a Flash Gordon pinball machine in my garage. Yes, I saw. I saw. I think you put some some photos of that up at one time. I was like, oh, man, there's another unicorn I've got to gotta try to put my hands on. I've got to really not give that. Kevin your address. <laughs> yeah. I keep it like, a, a, a secret. Yeah. Scott's like, where'd all my stuff go? <laughs> no, that, that's why it's a secret. I have a secret address. So, that's, Scott, I mean, you've you've definitely you've worked on some amazing stuff, and and obviously, I'm a huge Star Wars fan myself. Uh, got a lot. Of, I've got probably about eighty percent of my vintage collection still. What's your dream project now? If if you got the call tomorrow to work on X, what would it be? You know, um, I I've been thinking about like all the different things I've been able to work on over the years. And I have not got to do Transformers themselves. I've done the uh, Hiss tank that was Shockwave for the G.I. Mm -hmm. Joe crossover. I painted that. Um, I've got to work on G.I. Joe. I've got to work on Star Wars. I got to work on Tron. Um, I did Thundercats for Bandai. I, you know, I've hit a lot of those pieces but I haven't done Transformers and I haven't done Micronauts because they haven't made a new Micronaut series mm -hmm. or ROM. I would love to do, you know, ROM and Micronauts in some capacity yes. at some point. Oh my gosh. I'd love to see, I would love to see new ROM and new Micronauts. That would oh be yeah. It, it's, it's a licensing issue. The reason why they're so difficult to deal with. Uh, it's unfortunate. Um, I did hear the backstory one time about ROM and where it was almost done. It was a done deal. And then, like, the guy that, that owns the toy came out of the woodwork and's like, what about my cut? And they just said, okay, oh. we're, done. We're, not, we're not dealing with this. This is too difficult. Yeah, it's 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 sad when that kind of stuff happens. I, I listened to an episode a couple nights ago. Um, Bob Layton had come on and was talking about, you know, how things get spliced up when he did stuff with the Iron Man movie. And then, you know, some of the conversations that were had, that never came to fruition, right? Like they were supposed to kind of do, because he had came up with actually the name for Rhodey, right? He came wow. up with that whole thing, never got paid for it. That was just, yeah. he invented that character and then never got it. And then um, there's a collector that kind of, kind of touts every time he buys an original, you know, Bob Layton cover and, and shows him, oh, I paid $50,000 for this original art. And on the, on the episode I watched, Bob was like, yeah, I probably sold that for a hundred bucks to pay the rent, you know, back in the day. So, yeah, you know, uh, it, it's 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 sad that you know a lot of these artists don't get residuals when their art is when their art is resold because it is now a different property. Yep. And some artists try to work that into their uh, contract. Um, Sergio Agrones does is like you can buy my art, but if you sell it, I get a percentage on the back end of that. And right. some artists, you know, you can 
you can do that with that contract or you can say, no, once I bought it, it's mine and I can do whatever I want with it. And, uh, you know, that's just the weird way that art works. Uh, it is. It's, you and, know, and... I, I always think about those paintings that were just blow ups of Russ Heath's art. Yep. And that guy sold them for millions of dollars. And here was Russ Heath, you know, keeping his recycling his cans so he could have stuff to eat. You know, and like that, he was a guy that could have used a percentage of his artwork. Yeah. And uh, it's it's a it's a weird place. And that's where like the NFTs yes. do have a world, a, a project, a price in the world, because it does mean a residual goes back to the artist and they can continue to get paid for something. I explained it to somebody the other day. I was asking about how that worked and said, OK, it's kind of like if you sold the original Babe Ruth bat signed, it's worth X. But if you take that Babe Ruth bat and you throw it in a wood chipper and you sell all the individual pieces of the bat, it adds up to more for the bat. And then, of course, you know, Babe Ruth, like you said, family gets residuals off the pieces of the bat. I said, yeah, that's kind of how it works. On, on, on how, how royalties work for different pieces of art, but original art is often sold as a piece and therefore residuals aren't built into the price unless it was signed at the time of the selling. It still doesn't go past the next selling unless it's worked into the contract for that next sales. Right. So, and, and you got to watch, I mean, I, you know, stuff surfaces, I'm a big original art person and, and I've got all the walls covered with a bunch of stuff from original, you know, comics and everything. And it's interesting. We explain the whole IP, you know, intellectual property thing to people all the time. And also when we do work with people, we talk about how we do all the NDAs and the non-disclosure agreements and explain them that helps protect their IP and how that works because a lot of people coming into the industry don't understand how that works. Yeah, and, it's it's something you need to know or you will find out the wrong way at some point. Yes, mm -hmm. I have tons of friends that have gone, you know what, I sold my IP off to the publisher and then they decided to do nothing with it and it took me 10 years to buy my IP back and I paid twice for it for what I sold it for and then I heard that story over and over and over again and it just well, breaks mean, your heart. It, it it's a it's a it's a crazy world out there on that on on those rights and that's why there's ip lawyers you have to pay mm -hmm. to figure that stuff out as you go forward with any kind of meaningful idea absolutely yeah. it's it's yeah. probably an episode in and of itself we could have with people explaining how <laughs> that works because there's a lot of questions about it and a lot of gray areas people just really don't truly don't understand yeah yeah absolutely but um if you had to pick if there was if you had to pick one toy I know it's a tough question. If you had to pick one toy that's your absolute favorite of everything that you have, because let me tell you what, people, his collection, if you just go online and look for is expansive. It's incredible. Watch the shows. Check them out. Um, listen to the interviews. He, he, you know, Scott's the, the end all be all. He is very knowledgeable about toys. And and so if there's one you had to pick, what would the one you would have to, to you know, to you know, you to, that's 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 a difficult question, because <laughs> obviously I've never settled on one toy. Yep. No. Um, you know, I I have lots of toys of all types of stuff, and I have multiple different favorite toys, but I don't think there's one all end all toy of everything. I can tell you one toy that kind of started it all. There you go. Okay. Um, and that was my Shogun Warrior Mazinger Z. Mm, nice. Uh, I got that for Christmas, 1980. I had a dream that it was under the tree before Christmas. Nice. Like a Christmas night, I dreamt it was under the tree. So like when I open, I'm like, oh, okay, here's my Mazinger. How come I don't have Guy King in my stocking? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I was saw a Guy King in my stocking last night. I'm like, no, that you dreamt that, you know? Yeah. But uh, that toy, I think, really led me down the path that led to today. It, awesome. it ruined my entire life. From being a uh, a hard worker, a you know a welder or something like my dad, to being a toy guy, because um, that toy just led me down that world of of comic books and more toys and more robots and imagination, and it never left me. You know, some people they they hit a certain age and they're like, I'm done with that. I'm now building cars and wrenching trucks, whatever they're, mm -hmm. and uh, for me, I just put all of my 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 thought and my energy and my power into the creative fields of toys and comics and science fiction and movies and and tapes and you know that world i absorbed it like a sponge and that's how 
I get calls now to do TV shows and whatnot because I am that toy guy that knows yep. all the toys. That's awesome. Uh, it's uh, it's it's amazing to see that you stuck with it. You know, I've kind of I kind of came back around. You know, I kind of took a hiatus from it and then missed it. Right, it was part of my life that I just yearned for that fun and creative side. And then just, it, it pulled me back in like a tractor beam, you know, I just couldn't escape it at that point. And I won't give it up again. You know, like you said, it's going to be good. something that's, I'm going to stick with it. Um, I started hand drawing again, you know, and, uh, you know, knock the, knock the, the rust off the wrist and, uh, and started drawing again and having a lot of fun with it. Cause I, you know, it's just, it's just a part of me that's wired in me and always has been since it was a child. And it's awesome to see somebody like yourself that's, you know, always clung to it and always had it be steadfast for your, for your trajectory. So it was, it was definitely hard. And I can't say that I didn't go through some dark times of like, just, I'm going to give up. And, and eventually it, it all really worked out. Um, you know, I still have friends of mine from high school today. They're like, I can't believe that, you know, you're that guy that you you're, you live in that world that you dreamt of as a kid. And now that's my world. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us uh, this afternoon, Scott. And, um, always, uh, I'll be on the lookout for your next new cool biggest thing and, uh, <laughs> and have, have fun with the collection and, uh, and enjoy. Thank you very much. Uh, you can find articles every day at toy wizards.com. Uh, and then uh, I'm on Instagram as Scott Zillner. You can easily follow me there. And the next couple events are Robo Toy Fest in May and Power Morphicon in August and then ToonCon in October. Awesome. I'll okay. gather all those links up for me, Scott, and we'll go ahead and post them back in the feed uh, when everything goes out. So um, everybody should make sure where they can catch you. So I'll awesome. I'll be jumping Thanks on Instagram here momentarily to dig you up myself and follow, start following you. There we go. I got lots of cool stuff on my Instagram page. I try awesome. to. I really curate that to to being cool. Awesome. awesome. We'll uh, we'll definitely get the word out there and uh, and get you get you some more uh, attention to that uh, the, the fun <laughs> that you having, man. It's just it's awesome to be along for the ride. And, and again, uh, it was it was a pleasure to speak with you and uh, and kind of go through kind of how you got where you got and uh, and and what's when what's coming up ahead. I can't wait to see the uh, release of the spaceship you're working on. That's I'm, already I'm, supposed to be released. Yeah, I'm, 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 all, I'm always working on something. Uh, I, I'm currently uh, a sideshow painter for Unruly. You can look up me there. Yep. Nice. And uh, lots of other toys. So, you know, go out there and have fun. That's the biggest thing I can tell you. Don't give up. Have fun and do what you love. There you go. Great, my, uh, great words for everybody out there. My, my paltry legends. They say it was a pleasure and an honor to meet you. And the next it's, time it's we nice see you, we'll you try. bigger. It's nice, nice. that you're trying. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I've a, only been back seriously collecting for maybe about seven years. So You know, the, you, there's no gatekeeper. You can collect any way you want, buy yep. anything you want, display it any way you want, yep. leave it in the box, open it, play with it yep. in the tub. All that matters is that you have fun with toys. That's exactly yes. it. I mean, and that's, I, I write a toy review column on my website. And the biggest thing that I say is, you know, you, you just enjoy it. Exactly. You don't collect something because in 10 years, I, I used to own a sports card memorabilia shop. Don't collect something because in 10 years, it's going to be worth money. Don't bank on it being worth money. Bank on it being something fun in 10 years for you. Yeah. So, so meeting you and then, and seeing all the work you've done. I mean, honestly, you know, all, all kidding aside, this is a huge honor for me because, <laughs> Uh, you know, because like you are, you are for a toy collector, you are a god for us. You know, <laughs> I, I, all I've been doing is just you know keeping my head based on what I doing, what I love, and that's toys. Amen to and, that. And I can say, you know, it was it was always been fun. And that's why I said another reason I had to get you on the show. When you go out and look at Scott Zillner's Facebook page, you will see a smile on his face in every <laughs> photo. Yep. It yep. if you feel it down home for the day. If you're just feeling kind of, just go zoom past 10 shots of Scott and he's always giving the thumbs up and smiling. I'm like, man, that's infectious. I did, meet, I did meet Henry Winkler several times and I told him I do the thumbs up in all of my photos. And he said, hey, you keep on doing that, man. So I have the, the fawn sign of approval to do there thumbs you. up in all my images. See now that explains it. That just kind of fooled. That kind of <laughs> that kind of brought it all back around, right yeah, there. Yeah, it's, so. it's Fonzie approved. So it, it's not it's not a bootleg thumbs up. That's a Fonzie approved. <laughs> a bootleg thumbs up. Yeah, bootleg thumbs up are kind of you know. But now the oh. not, not that it's official, I I uh, I can see that now. I can see. Although that. from what I hear, 
bootleg thumbs up could be more valuable than the real. You never know. Yeah, yeah. You, you never, never know. know. Those, uh, you know, halfway thumbs. No, it's it's, it's straight thumbs up. up. It's all the way up. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, we'll get all those links in the in the broadcast and get everything out there for you. And uh, you have a you have a great night, sir. And we'll, uh, all we'll right. talk. We'll talk Thanks again soon, on, guys. Thank you very much. Right, have a wonderful weekend, man. Thank you so much for your time. Take care. Alrighty. Bye. Man, that was so much fun. It's it's just all oh, just like I said. It's just. The, the pictures are infectious, man. You just go there yeah. picture after picture after picture, and he's always excited, always upbeat. And uh, like I said, I, I'm just going to flash it back on the screen for those of you who think you might have something to do with cons. That right there is having something to do with cons. I saw yeah. that list, and I was like, good Lord. you know. And that's just amazing because that's giving back, right? You know, Cons are a lot of work. They're a lot of effort that takes a lot to get stuff pulled off. People a lot of times don't realize the ins and outs and the behind the scenes it takes to pull these things off. And um, he's out there getting it done, man. So hats off to him again. You know, that's why I said that's why I kind of go back and say, you know, that kind of falls into the the whole, you know, Titans of Industry uh, setup. And again, I I consider him, you know, on the Titans of Industry side, you know, Titans of Industry, you know, toy edition. Right. Because that's that's what he is. Absolutely. And, And, you know, even from a smaller perspective, back when I had my sports card shop and we'd organize, you know, we'd organize weekend sports card and comic shows, you know, we might have. 15, 20 tables, but the time and amount of energy that went into organizing one of those. Now you, you blow it up to where you've got a few hundred tables. Oh yeah. And you're bringing in, you know, you're bringing in X, Y, and Z from all over the country. I, yeah, I tip my hat for him to run all that. I mean, that's uh that's just, that's remarkable. That's, that's just giving back. And, and, and speaking of giving back, let's run through, we're going to run through the previews uh, real quickly and then we'll let you guys go. So all the previews you're fixing to see real quick, you can run over to inkedpub.com and check those out. And we're going to kind of run through what's out there right now and then what's coming. So right off the bat, uh, make sure you go over to inkedpub.com and check out Amerikaiju. Amerikaiju is from uh, Edgar Paston, who also does a lot with toys. And it's really a cool thing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach over uh, and grab it. And tell you what, amazing book. There's going to be a review coming soon on on the copies that I got. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna check that out. We'll we'll post some more stuff up. He's got ten days left the campaign, f- all full steam ahead. We're gonna make this thing happen. So here is again, and as I'll do, I'll do as Edgar always does. It's as big as my head, so that's how he always pitches it. But you know, it's just a a, a cool cool figure. Um, I love the cotton candy mix on this one. It, it articulates well. It, and I was surprised at the size of this thing when it came in because I was expecting just kind of a little small kaiju. But what's small about kaiju, right? So yeah. when the package came in, it was nice 70s packaging. It was this huge kaiju figure that came in there. So we um, we stepped in and said, you know what? When the next book comes out for four, five, and six, we're going to sponsor one. And we sponsored a kaiju that announced it. And it, it sold out immediately, which was awesome. So mm-hmm. make sure you, you run over to inked.pub. Uh, forward slash Amerikaiju. Go check out that book. Make sure you get a piece of it. Um, next one up is Shadow's Daughter. And Shadow's Daughter is got um, a good bit of time left. It's probably a little over halfway through. It's funded and then some. Uh, it became a project we love from Kickstarter. The thing funded in uh, just under 30 minutes. So um, you got to make sure you go check that out. Uh, again, swing over there. And we're going to kind of run through a quick... Um, I'll show you a quick sample of the video for that. And uh, here is a little bit more about uh, Shadow's Daughter. Next up is Cryptic Haze. Cryptic Haze is another one that got a project we love from Kickstarter. So two of them sitting in the in the queue right now that are active. Uh, both have project we love stamped on them. And uh, Cryptic Haze has another probably 10 or 12 days left. It's got a few more days left to it. It's, it's going strong. So make sure you check out that book offered by Paul Gomez. And uh, to back up a second, Shadow's Daughter is out there from Morgan Quaid. So make sure you check out Shadow's Daughter, uh, Mare Kaiju, and check out... Um, cryptic haze 
from Paul Gomez. That's going on strong right now. And in the announcement side for the coming soon, coming soon, uh, newsflash is Woodstake. And Woodstake is another offering from uh, Sean Hainsworth, who did uh, The Killing Machine that just uh, it, it funded it very well on Kickstarter. And this is his second uh, IP offering. And Woodstake is, um, is of it. Woodstake is, of course, about vampires. And um, it's about if vampires descended on Woodstock. And I won't give too much away about that, but it is three days of peace, music, and blood. So make sure you you check out Woodstake and, and stake your claim today, right? And it's going to be coming out uh, early March. So first uh, week or so of March, that book's going to come out. You don't want to miss it. Uh, it's going to be on the Zoop platform. So that's something that uh, we've had a few of them on Zoop, and uh, they've done well. So Zoop's going to take on this one and see what's going on with it. And then next up, uh, well, you know what, before, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and give you a sneak peek of what's actually happening um, with that campaign. This is um, this is the video that our sister company Fallout Studios put together. Again, Fallout Studios and Vanilla Groove uh, team up and give you stuff like this. Now, the really, really cool thing about that is that is not Hendrix on guitar. That is our very own Morgan Quaid on guitar. So um, with his background in music and the amazing things he does, and we have him on, uh, he'll actually be on uh, next week. So you're going to want to tune into that and not miss it because he's going to be kind of talking about what Shadow's Daughter is. And again, so episode 44 is going to have featured Morgan Quaid on there. And we're going to talk about what's going on with the book. What's coming out next after that book? Because In Midi is another book that he has in process, plus a whole lot of other good things. Um, and we'll talk about the further adventures of Shadow's Daughter and what's coming up. So you're going to want to check out that. And the, another, another announcement we'd like to make is that uh, right now, um, Stanley has come to uh, Inked. And uh, so Stanley the Snowman is going to be on from Austin Genowitz. And it's a book you've probably often seen. Uh, the number one issue came out on Snoop. And uh, Scoot is when Scoot is the other version of Scout, which is the kids version. So when you look on there, uh, the issue two is coming out. It's going to be Stanley. And it's going to be Operation Save the Holidays. So be sure you look for these ads all over the place and you sign up. If you sign up early. There's some early bird specials out there that we're going to be talking about uh, in the next couple of episodes. We're going to have Austin on to talk about that as well. And then if you sign up now, uh, just go over to inked.pub forward slash Stanley the Snowman. There's going to be some cool things that you can you can possibly win by signing up early. So make sure you get over there, share it out. Um, you know, sharing is caring, right, as they say. And so make sure you get the word out there about Stanley that he's back and he's going to be doing this next issue. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, don't miss out on Austin Genoas uh, coming out again with Stanley. So that's the other a big announcement for the coming soons. we got a whole stack coming. There is literally 20 books in production right now for the next couple of months. So that's only two out of the 20. So just stay tuned for a whole lot of goodness coming out. One of the ones that's about to come over from uh, Patreon to Kickstarter is this book, which we've talked about in many, many episodes, which is Mara. And Mara is going to be making her debut. The story arc is wrapping up now. So he's able to go ahead and bring that over to Kickstarter. Be sure to look out for that. And um, you're just going to just gonna have a lot of fun if you if you take a look at these next few books coming out. Because, man, we just thought the tail end of last year was chocker block. And then we got in the first part of this year and just book after book after book after books coming out. You'll see a lot of episodes uh, coming out from us and advertisements called The Road to 75. So we're, we're making a beeline for the 75th campaign, and we're just having a lot of fun along the way. Make sure you tune into everything on the NSC Roadshow, which is the podcast tour, which there's several podcasts associated with NSC Roadshow, uh, going out there and getting it done and talking about 
creators out there, talking about books out there, talking about projects out there, talking about toys out there, because Dan's very own Toy Box is now with the Roadshow, and there's going to be some episodes coming up for toy reviews. A lot of goodness in there, and uh, just a lot of people just having a lot of fun with um, going out there and, and you know, trying to spread the word, and that's what it's all about, trying to get those things out there. Um, we have a lot of fun doing it. We're glad you guys uh, hung out with us for another episode, and um, we're on the road to 50. Uh, we just had the one-year anniversary for Comic Rottery, which was a lot of fun to have. It was, you know, we, we, we didn't quite hit the 50 episode mark because we kind of took the December off and played the best of. So um, we're happy to, to come up on the 50th episode coming soon. So uh, any, any closing words you'd like to give the listeners, Dan, about what's coming up with Dan's Toy Box and some of the things that are out there now and the website, where to go and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, just uh, last couple of weeks, launched a new website for reviews. Um, got a bunch of action figure reviews up. The website's www.danstoybox.com. Uh, you can go on, subscribe, and you'll get an email notification every time a new post goes up. Um, we've got a couple of creator interviews up. Our very own Edgar Paston's up there, and uh, interview with Mitchell Breitweiser from Allegiance Arts is up. I'm actually going to be writing some comic book reviews on on the fair from Allegiance Arts, and I'm going to be getting a review, hopefully here within the next week or so, up on, on America I Jew. Uh, I'll tell you what, man, phenomenal books, phenomenal creators. You know, I got to say, since uh, since linking my horse to the Ink Studios wagon there, I, I have been uh, impressed with the independent comic creators that I've been introduced to, that I've been meeting and, and getting to speak with. And so just a whole lot of fun. I got a section on the toy box, uh, you know, for my, for my figure photography. And you know, I'm, I am far from being anywhere near a professional photographer, but in my amateurness, I, uh, I enjoy the, the, the work that I'm turning out. And you know what, like, uh, like Scott said, Hey, have fun with it. I, I don't write the reviews to make money. I don't write the reviews to to get attention. I write the reviews because I just love talking about toys. And, you know, honestly, if if somebody's reading a review that I write and it makes a difference in their, in their whether or not they're going to go out and spend the money on that figure, you know, then then more power to them. I just want to try to be objective and, you know, and I'll admit it when I'm writing them or even when I'm recording them. If I'm not going to be able to be objective about a figure, I'm going to tell you right up front. Yeah, there's figures I gush about, and there's figures I'm like, oh god, this thing sucks, <laughs> and you know, but um, but now, nah, man, he's right. It's all about having fun, and that's the toy box. The toy box is all fun, and being a part of Ink Studios is just uh, it's just bringing it all together. So nice. Well, we're we're glad to have you. It's it's a lot of fun because you know, uh, comics and toys go hand in hand, and there's awesome creators on both sides, and and some people run the gamut back and forth. Um, some of the things that uh, in Scott's career, I noticed that he's actually been drawn into comics uh, in, in some instances. So, you know, um, it's it's fun to have those two worlds collide and, and they do it so well. Right. Um, and and we like being a part of it. We like being able to bring the, the new creators on board. And, and you know, we, we have fun uplifting other creators. That's the part about it. I think that's the most fun for me for Inc. is being able to get out there and, and meet all these people and, and show off their work and say, look, these guys are doing something awesome. These girls are doing something awesome. You know, come check them out. Come do what they're see what they're doing. And a lot of them get to make careers out of it, which is awesome to see. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you said something to me a long time ago and you used a phrase coined by our friend Monty Michael Moore. All ships rise together. Yep. And yep. you know what? It's more fun to sail when you've got a flotilla than it is when you're on the sea by yourself. It is, man. And it's it's nice to be, and it's nice when um, you're working on all these other projects and then you get a phone call or an email out of the blue that says, hey, uh, we got through with the project that you did for us a couple of projects ago. We just got fulfillment done. We'd like for you guys to do the next one, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, that's that's a good feeling. That's a good feeling to have people come right back and say, yeah, we, we love what you did the, with this one. The team did an awesome job. Um and, and we want to see you do more. And that's just a good feeling all the way around. So awesome to, awesome to have everybody in the Ink family. And again, the Ink family wall is always behind me here. And that's many of the books that we were uh, the marketing on for because we, you know, help support. You know, we, uh, we're, we're out there just helping, trying to, trying to get word out there and trying to get things funded. And um, on, on the, the comic writer side, if you like what you see, here's where to get some more of it. For more fun-filled episodes, come visit our website www.comicrottery.com